So, so that's perfect. Um, that's great. So we're going to hear today from four uh, different uh, panelists, all of whom have some experience one way or another of postdocing and being postdocs, managing postdocs. So this is uh, Vasil Ersek from Northumbria, uh, Ellie Georgiadis from Oxford, uh, Babette Hugaka from Harriet Watt, and Alex Krauss from UCL. Uh, and so over to them, basically, I get to stop my screen sharing now so that hopefully you can get, uh, get to see all of them. There we go. Um, and, and so let's start. And the first question I have for you all just to uh, set the scene is to introduce who you are um, and what your, what your experience has been of, of being a postdoc. So let's start. I can see Alex, you're at uh, the top of my screen. So let's start with, start with you. Okay, I'm Alex. I'm a biogeochemical modeling postdoc at UCL. Um, I did my PhD at the University of Leeds, and I did a mixture of both lab work and modeling work during my PhD. And that might kind of be useful for kind of later questions. Um, so this is my first postdoc, and I'm on a ECR-funded uh, postdoc, which is it's kind of worked out quite well because it's the one Brexit benefit that we've had is that my postdoc was originally meant to be two years long and I'm now starting my fourth year. So um, that's the one Brexit bonus that we've had. Um, it's kind of been interesting so far because I started during the pandemic, essentially. Um, and because I'm a modeler, I've kind of been working from home for pretty much the entirety of the postdoc. And also my PI is now in a different country. So there have been certain challenges, um, but also benefits in terms of that kind of unique setup with my postdoc. Um, but we can talk about that more a bit more after. Great, thanks, Alex. Um, let's move to uh, Ellie. Hiya. Um, so I finished my PhD in uh, 2020. I was split between the University of Bordeaux in France and University Laval in Canada. And I started looking for postdocs during the pandemic and I had actually planned to take some time off. And then when I couldn't do anything, then I sort of got stuck and thought, oh, well, actually, I need to start looking for postdocs. Um, so that was sort of a mad time in, in my life where I was desperately trying to find a postdoc. So I've applied, honestly, to so many. Um, and yeah, ended up um, getting offered a postdoc, a one year postdoc at um, the University of Durham. Durham University with Bob Hilton and um, it it was completely different to what I'd done during my PhD and doing that you know sh shift in field during a one-year postdoc is absolutely crazy so yeah uh, please ask me questions about that um, and after that I struggled again to find another postdoc and there was, I was asking myself a lot of questions about whether you know if, if I'm trying so hard and I'm not getting anywhere then is this the right path for me? And then I got a surprise that um, a fellowship that I applied for got funded. So now I'm I'm um, continuing as a as a postdoctoral fellow at ETH in Zurich. Um, just moved here earlier this month. Here we go. Thank you. Um, how about uh, Vasil? Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm an associate professor at Northumbria Uni, and I specialize in paleoclimate reconstructions, mainly using uh, spilothems. I did my PhD in the US uh, at Oregon State uh, University, uh, where I studied uh, spilothem geochemistry as well. Then um, I got a Marie Curie uh, postdoctoral fellowship uh, and moved to Oxford, where I stayed for two years and then got another two-year postdoc uh, at Oxford, also working in spilothems. So I was fortunate or unfortunate enough to, to work on broadly similar uh, research areas throughout my PhD in postdoc and, and what I'm currently doing. Perfect, thank you. And last but certainly not least, uh, Papa. Hi, um, I'm an associate professor at Harriet Watt University. I'm a paleoceanographer and I like to play with four rams. Um, I did my PhD in Southampton. Um, after that, I was very lucky to get a, a postdoc in Cambridge. Um, I've had uh, quite a bit of career disruptions with having children and stuff like that. Um, so and after that, I worked with Andy Ridgewell in Bristol for a year. Then after that, I got a NERC fellowship um, and I was in, 
Oxford for three years, but at the same time that Vasily was there as well. Um, and then in 2017, I started as a kind of fellow slash assistant professor at Harry Watt. And then I got promoted a couple of years ago, basically. Um, but yeah, lots of career breaks. I think I've had four years of, of my, you know, times that I've been doing kind of post uh, PhD uh, stuff. Great, okay. So the first question then, thinking about applying for postdocs is, as a PhD student, um, when should you start looking for or applying for postdoc positions? And, and I guess I'll wrap into that as well. Should you um, contact groups a year in advance, for example, rather than waiting for job adverts to actually uh, come out? Who wants to go with that? I can start. Um, okay. So it kind of depends on what you want to do, essentially. If you want to apply for certain fellowships, like, for example, US-based ones, they often advertise you in advance. So you have to think about when your PhD is gonna finish and kind of work around their timeframes. Um, similarly, for if you're applying for NERC fellowships or um, Marie Curie or that kind of thing, you have to kind of work your way around their deadlines. Um, in terms of other opportunities, I applied for my one um, sort of as I was entering the kind of half a year of writing up phase. Um, and that was my um, PhD supervisor was contacted by my current PI to kind of say, do you have any PhD students who might be interested in applying for this postdoc that I've got coming up? Um, so mine was very much kind of on the grapevine. Um, but yeah, I would say as you're kind of entering your writing up phase, have a look for job adverts and start applying for those if you see any. Anyone else want to step in? Yeah, before we keep in with the order Definitely. that we introduce ourselves with. Um, I think it depends how picky you are as well. Like if you if you're set on doing something that's that that you know that you want this is what you want to do, um, then maybe start like, you know, the earlier the better, because that's going to increase your chances of, of finding. I mean, there could be an ad, an advert for a postdoc, you know, on one date and even though you're still a year away, like it could still be worth you chatting to these people, um, even if you can't actually apply, you know. Um, and then, yeah, just just the more picky you are, the more time you have to give yourself to to find something, I would say. Uh, Vasily? Yeah, I think uh, one year is a, is a good time frame to have in mind when thinking about inquiring about postdocs. Um, and yes, it, it, it it is a good idea to have a look at various deadlines for fellowships, whether it's a NERC fellowship or Marie Curie or any other kind of fellowship so that you have an idea when would you have to uh, meet uh, meet that deadline. It, I would say it also is a good idea to contact the labs that you would like to work uh, in or the PIs that you would like to work with um, informally quite well in advance. And this could be, at a, at a conference, or maybe they visit your department to give a, a seminar. So approach them fairly early on, um, and that will give you an opportunity to make yourselves known to, to the PI. And it, it shouldn't make a difference, but I, I think there, there is a difference when you apply for a job and, and you are known to the person that you want to work with already and you had some interaction compared to having that application come in out of the blue. So for, um, you know, that that may not come naturally uh, for you, especially if you're an introvert, it's, it's not very easy to get out of your shell and approach people like that. But um, if you can do it, I think it has some benefits. So, so be proactive, I guess, is what you're saying. Um, but that, do you want to add anything or do you think they will... Uh... No, no, I, I would like to add something. I think uh, Ali is saying but whether you're picky or not is a, is a, is a big thing. Uh, if you're not picky, um, I think if you, you know, if you get to do talks and conferences or anywhere to kind of leave with a slide saying like, you know, I'm in with, with six months of finishing my PhD and looking for uh, postdocs, um, you know, this is what I'm interested in. Or if you're doing a poster at a conference and having, you know, your picture on there and also saying like, you know, looking for, 
uh, postdocs and things like that. That helps as well, I think. Sometimes you just get people to come and talk to you, basically. Yeah, I'd just like to add that if you are sort of approaching the end of your PhD and you haven't kind of got in touch with anybody, don't panic because there are jobs that just pop up because people have a big pot of funding and suddenly like, they've got to spend it within half a year and so they kind of advertise jobs quite at short notice. So yeah, don't don't worry if you haven't kind of done this a year in advance or anything, there are still opportunities out there as well. Yeah, good point. You know, sometimes a postdoc can leave and suddenly there's funding available for that position, et cetera. Um, so one other question, which we haven't touched on there is, um, what are the sort of online resources or websites that you particularly recommend? So this might be a quick one, but are there any obvious uh, websites that you would use to find opportunities? Um, jobs.ac.uk often have postdocs um, listed on there. And sometimes universities will advertise um, like research fellowships on there that they would want you to contact somebody via them to both jointly apply for something together. Um, so that's one. I guess the other is just often university have kind of resources as to which fellowships are available. So um, university kind of uh, admin staff often send around opportunities as well via emails. So keep an eye out for those and that kind of thing. Also, um, most UK universities subscribe to Research Professional, uh, which you can use to set up email alerts based on, on jobs that are advertised. So I found that uh, useful in advising my PhD students, for example, when, when they should look at a specific job. So you can set as a PhD student, sh you should be able to set those kind of alerts uh, yourselves as, as well. Yep, yeah, I also used um, the jobs.co.uk, I think it is. Um, and what I would do um, during my year as a postdoc is I would set a time like every, I don't know, at the Friday at lunchtime, I would go through there and just check what's new because then it's easier than to check it, I don't know, monthly or every two months because they can build up quite a lot. And on that website, you get mainly postdocs that are um, based in the UK. Um, occasionally, you might get some for other countries. Um, the other one that I found useful was Your Access, I think it's called, and you can look at projects I don't know. I, I saw some like in Brazil. So you, you've got like a broader geographical location, I think, for the for the postdocs. Yeah. Earthworks oh. and LinkedIn as well. Earthworks. Earthworks gives a lot of jobs globally. So you get Australia, um, Germany, Brazil, anywhere. And LinkedIn. Um, I've, I'm actually not on it, but I've heard other people to say that it's, it's very helpful because it's, it's mainly about professional uh, kind of relations. Yes, yeah, same for Twitter. Yeah. And there's also obviously the Geochemical Society and the European Association of Geochemistry, both of them have um, internet based job boards as well that will often post job openings. I saw Geochem mailing list is a good one where you see a lot of uh, job adverts being sent around. So if you're not already a subscriber, that might be a good idea. Cool. I think that's a lot of useful um, useful resources, useful opportunities to find positions. Um, so what about, there's a question here, if you're sat there here as a, as a PhD student at the moment, could, can you apply for a postdoc if you haven't necessarily published any papers yet? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think it's more about what you can bring in terms of your experience and working as a PhD student. So it's, I think a lot, it, it obviously depends on discipline as to how quickly you can publish a paper. Um, and I think any good PIs know that fact that, you know, some lab based stuff is really intensive and you just have to go through it in your entire PhD and then do the writing up afterwards. So yeah, I think it's, it's not a barrier. Any other thoughts on that from perhaps from the other side, from the, the from Vasily or Baba? I think also it depends on what the job is. 
um, because some jobs could be very much focused on setting up a piece of equipment and getting that running. Um, and if you've already got experience doing that, doing your PhD, that gives you an advantage. Um, but there's other jobs they might, you know, want to see evidence that you've that you've written, or at least, you know, you have to indicate that your willingness to write papers and things like that. It just it just depends. Yeah, just as an example, we do we do have um, a postdoc in our department who got the job with no um, no publications at the time when when they applied, but they had extensive experience working with the specific instrument that we needed uh, that postdoc to work on. So and and um, the references and and everything else in in the application were great. So we didn't have any concerns that. Uh, the person wouldn't be suitable for the job, even without uh, publications. Yeah, so sometimes geochemistry takes time. And I think, as you say, any sensible PIs would recognize uh, recognize this and find many other ways to figure out that you, you'd be strong, strong for a position. But that does fit in quite well to the next um, question. And maybe we'll come to you, Ali, which was, um, can you apply for a postdoc in a different field from your uh, PhD? Yeah, like, not only can you, I would encourage it. It's it's really hard because especially if you've got like a one year postdoc and you're having to come, you know, completely up to date with a field that you maybe have never even heard of before, you know, seeing this job advertisement. Um, so the longer the better in that case. But it's it's incredibly rewarding because you're I mean, I, I just noticed how many more people I could engage with in the department because I had this completely different um, experience in paleoceanography and earth surface processes. It just brings everyone together. And it made it so much easier to network with people at conferences and um, yeah, workshops. Like it's, yeah, I, I would definitely recommend it. Um, and even if it's not a field that you are attracted to like um I have to admit that when I applied to the postdoc that I that I got I wasn't particularly interested in earth surface processes I just applied out of pure desperation um and in the end I've loved it I, I really have loved it and it's just given me so many opportunities to further um my career in academia so I'm incredibly grateful it, even if you're not happy with it with the specific postdoc it, it can be amazing. So just don't let that hold you back. Great, yeah, and a, a nice combination of topics, I'd say, but I may be slightly biased. Um, anyone else on sort of moving, moving subjects into a, into a postdoc? Not me personally, but um, a friend of mine, um, he, we did our PhD together and he was also um, looking into deep time kind of processes and now he's doing modeling of microplastics and rivers and so it's very different so yeah it shows the utility that the skills that you have that you build up as a PhD can be applicable to lots of different subject areas so don't worry if there isn't something out there specifically on what you've been working on in your PhD it's you know different transferable skills that you can bring to different projects So um, I did my, uh, I have switched careers quite a bit. So I did an undergraduate in um, physical geography. Then my PhD was in marine geology and it started off looking at turbidites and just kind of seeing how many there was and looking at their chem geochemistry. And I got very quickly bored with that. Um, and so I started then working on the kind of the little layers in between, which are kind of the, you know, normal sedimentation. And that's how I got into paleoceanography. Um, so when I applied for a job with Cambridge, um, because of my sedimentological background, I could, I, I actually got offered a job to work with Nathan Cave. Uh, I wanted to do geochemistry because I started to get really interested in that. But be, when I then started my postdoc with Nathan Cave, I then also got access to the labs to kind of get trained in geochemistry. And so with a lot of um, other stuff then, and so I just kind of uh, slowly increased my toolbox of, of things that I could do, basically. Perfect. I think there's, yes, yeah, so there's at least two, two and a half great examples, if you count Alex's example of his friend, that of people who made a big success of shifting and strengthening 
you know, getting a job on the basis of one skill set and then learning others um, on that job. Let's think about, um, as we come towards the end of this first section, um, we can perhaps stay with you for that essential on, on screen right now. What, what is a PI looking for in hiring a postdoc? And in a sense, from the other side, um, what should you be emphasizing in a postdoc um, job application or um, interview? So is it with me and Fasil? Or... Yeah, you, you can start. Yeah. You can start. So oh. okay. um, right. Uh, so when we have to write a job description, we have to kind of, we have to put some things that we want in a person. So that that, that kind of um, key skills that, that you have to have. So basically, there's a whole you know admin department that will also look at these things, and they will want to take all the boxes. Um, so you know the way that we write. The job advert is, is very important yeah. to kind of you know for people to be for, for, to be for to be inclusive and to get as many people to apply. Um, but then there's like another list of you know of wanting things that you want, but that's not necessary basically. Um, and so yeah, take those skills right. If 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 if, you, if you're interested in a specific position. Take the skills that you have, and, and if there's some that you can't, if you don't have, then just be also on, honest about it that you're kind of happy to learn and do these kind of things. Um, but I think one thing that's just really important is enthusiasm. You know that really that someone is interested in the job, and that it's not just you know they find it somewhere and just use the same letter to kind of apply for it. You know where it could be <laughs> it's a completely different field uh, that they're trying to get a job in or something like that. Uh, so yeah, these kind of things help, and um, sometimes people also get in touch beforehand to just kind of ask, you know, some more questions if there's some things that they don't know about and things like that, and, and that's not a problem basically. Yeah, I'm I'm always surprised by the number of people who don't read carefully the application uh, documents, and they're not aware that they need to. To answer specific questions, um, so if if the application includes, uh, you know, uh, skills that you must have, then it's really important in your cover letter or some way in your application to mention in what way you meet those uh, criteria. So as Babette was saying, it, that we have desirable criteria or or essential criteria. So may, do make sure that you cover the uh, how you meet the essential uh, criteria. Otherwise, you may find yourself quickly in the pile of rejected applications, even though uh, otherwise your application is uh, excellent. Um, so keep in mind that, uh, you know, for, for any job um, application these days, there will be tens or in sometimes even hundreds uh, of applicants. So any kind of weakness that even pr procedural weakness that there is in your application that quickly puts you at the bottom of, of the pile. Um, the the other thing that um, I would emphasize is that a lot of people in the application focus on on what they've done and kind of uh, use their their CV and past experience to highlight their skills, which which is important to do. Uh, but it is also very important, as Babette was saying, to show enthusiasm and to show how your specific skills can contribute to the successful delivery of, of the project that you are applying or to meet the goals of the fellowship that you are applying as well. So not focus not just just on the work that you've done and, and your experience, but also have look forward to, to the work that you'll do and show why you are the best uh, person to do that. Did um, Eddie or Alex want to come in at all? Sure. Um... So when my PhD supervisor told me about this current postdoc, I was determined to meet my current PI at Goldschmidt. So I finally cornered him on one of the poster sessions and had a bit of a chat with him. And I think that's that's kind of uh, beneficial because as Vasily said earlier, it kind of, you know, it kind of builds this rapport straight away prior to applying for something. Uh, so you can do that via email as well. Um, in terms of then actually applying for the position, um, what I did was I kind of did a bit of research about the PI's kind of past publications and kind of got to know a bit about the subject area um, because 
obviously um, subjects are quite narrow. So even if you're kind of working on something that's fairly adjacent, there might still be kind of gaps in your knowledge. So it's always helpful to kind of get an understanding of the exact kind of thing that you might be working on. And then, yeah, as I still said, depending on what kind of application you've got, whether it's a big form or whether it's just a CV and cover letter, um, you know, make sure that you highlight what skills you've got and can bring to the project, but also what kind of things you might kind of have been thinking about um, when you've kind of been reading through, you know, your PI's publications and been like, ah, okay, they kind of want to do this with the project because they've done this in previous projects. So this is what I can bring. And this is, you know, kind of some initial thoughts I might have had about what we can do with this project that we've got advertised. I think you also need to keep in mind who will read your application. If you are mostly targeting the PI and they will be the main person responsible um, for making the decision, then of course you can you can use more um, technical language in, in your application. If, however, you need to convince a broad range of people, such as when you're applying for a fellowship, you do need to make sure that you know a petrologist or a um, you know paleoceanographer can equally get the message of why you are particularly you know well suited for that uh, that position. Can I just add one last thing in this question? Um, it, it's um, something particularly for the women out there. Like if you see a job that you're really interested in. Um, and you think you don't exactly meet every one of the criteria, you never know who else is going to apply. So just try and apply anyway. But like, if you've got the time to do it, just do it. Um, like I had in the many, many postdocs that I applied for, there was two. Um, postdoc number one that was, it looked like it had been written for me. It was honestly, it was in direct continuation with what I did with my PhD with some new elements in there. It was perfect. And my second postdoc, which was had nothing to do with my field of research, it there was only a slight overlap of one like tick in the job description with one small part of my PhD. For postdoc number one, I did a great interview and and um they called me, they said, listen, you were great. You couldn't have performed any better during your interview, but this other person has this experience that I thought was interesting because it would be new for me. They had that. So they offered him the position. Um, and this other job, I got the front, honestly, after the interview, I went to my bedroom and I cried for hours because I was just so embarrassed. It was so bad. But they called me and they said, listen, you were by far the most qualified applicant that applied to, to this position. So we'd love to offer you the job. And that came as a complete surprise to me. So if there's something that you're interested in, even if you don't meet all the criteria, don't ignore that. As Vasil said, like don't, don't just not mention it in your cover letter because they'll see that straight away, but try and say how you're interested in gaming that experience, how some of your previous experience might relate in some way. Um, yeah. Great, thanks. So there's one question we'll jump to that's in the Q and A. Um, I won't read out in detail, but it basically says, how do you know when a postdoc ad might be written for a specific candidate and the PI is only advertising it, you know, following HR principles? Is there an easy way to spot that, basically? Does that still happen? I'll maybe just ask um, Babette and Basil here, um, and then we'll move on to the next, next portion. Um, gosh, yeah, you don't know that, do you? Um, but even, but the thing is, even if it were written for someone else, uh, things can happen, right? It could be that the person actually decides that they don't want to come and that they've got something else. So you should just, you know, any job that you see and that you like, you should just write an application for it. Um, shouldn't, um, you know, let, don't let anything stop you. I mean, just the only thing is, obviously, getting rejections is hard and it's not nice. Um, so you need to, I think it's helpful if you, if you manage for yourself to get keep a good, you know, mental a picture of yourself that you know that you're good, right? And that maybe this time you didn't get this job for whatever reason, um, because you know there's lots of different reasons that there could be, but that it's not something to do with you personally, and just keep you know keep going at it basically. 
Yeah, I would echo that. I think it's impossible to know whether a job is specifically written for uh, for a person. Um, what what can happen though uh, is um, PI can write grants in which a, a postdoc is specifically written into that named on a proposal because the individual has specific uh, set of skills which uh, contribute to delivery of the grant obje objectives. So, but you can use that to your advantage, for example, when you contact the uh, PIs and ask them if they have any grants that they are currently writing that you could contribute to. And then if you can be named on, on that grant and reviewers of the grants generally look at that favorably because now, now they have a known quantity, if you will, a known individual with known skills that can deliver uh, the objectives of, of the grant. So, but but yes, I mean, you, you should be prepared to get lots of uh, rejections. Statistically speaking, it's it's very hard to, to get any kind of uh, uh, job and you need to just um, keep going at it and have confidence that the skills that you have will eventually get the a job for you that's uh, that's rewarding. Yeah, I think those are two great answers and they just echo what Ali said, right, which is apply for things if they look interesting and wait and see what um, happens because you never know. Um, okay, well, let's move on to a bit more about being a postdoc um, skills and sort of managing being a postdoc. Uh, one question here, and we can't go through obviously everything that happens during a postdoc in sort of 15 minutes, but um, one question is how much freedom do you have within a postdoc position to pursue your own research? Can I start? Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, I think I'm quite lucky because my PI is quite laid back about that kind of stuff. Um, so I do have a fair bit of freedom to kind of pursue some outside stuff and also to like finish writing up various parts of my PhD, uh, as well as working on projects specific for him as well. Um, obviously, it varies from PI to PI, and obviously also depends on how long your postdoc is as well. Thanks, Alex. Maybe Ali? Yeah, my, my supervisor was super nice. He just said, if you need to take one day a week to finish off your PhD stuff, like you feel free to do that. Um, however, with a one year postdoc change and fail, that was absolutely not possible. So I didn't have time and applying for the next job. I mean, um, so yeah, I guess it depends how long your postdoc is, how much work is stuffed into that postdoc. Because I mean, one year for me to do what I had was very dense. And what I ended up doing in the end was um, writing a fellowship proposal because I wanted to do my own research um, continuing with some of the things that I'd started during my postdoc. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's a great way to do your own research is to write a fellowship, but of course, like the chances of getting funding are, are so slim, so yeah. Uh, Babette, do you have any thoughts on that or Vesely? I, I have to say one thing, like um, UQRI is kind of making it, I don't know if it's mandatory, but they kind of, I think there's some written rules now or, or, or guidances to kind of allow early career researchers to have one day per week to work on their own thing. So that can be either, you know, finishing some stuff up from a postdoc, working on a different project that's unrelated um, to the project that they're doing and things like that. So that just, or even, you know, doing some training, additional training that's kind of not unrelated to the project that they're doing, which is really good. It gives you some time to work on yourself and things like that in your development, basically. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think mo most PIs should have the expectation that the postdoc will have to work on something else to prepare for the next uh, stage of their career or finish uh, writing up their PhD, unless, as Ellie was saying, you're something you've restricted by one year postdoc. But I think uh, you should uh, think very carefully whether you want to continue with a PI, which asks you to spend 100% of your time only working on that project because you need to, to grow as a scientist uh, as well. Uh, and, and that includes thinking about uh, and writing about other things than the project that you're hired to, to deliver. Yeah, absolutely. I think we'd probably all agreed on, 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 on that. And of course, the other aspect is that typically you might move on and do another postdoc or a fellowship and then be spending time writing up stuff from your previous project, which may well, so it's sort of almost everything tends to be a bit shifted and a bit delayed, right? So I think that's 
another way of thinking about it as well is that in future your pi should pro will probably be you'll probably be working with them still you won't stop immediately finish the the contract so um yeah so they should hopefully recognize that and and, and be reasonable with you basically um nevertheless and it, these sound like very positive experiences but another question is basically how did you manage your postdoc supervisor during your um postdoc position did you have if, you know i suppose were there any challenges are there any tips for managing um a postdoc supervisors or pi if you like uh, to get the best out of your postdoc i think at that stage it's a mentor right your pi is a mentor not a supervisor anymore well, exactly yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of tricky because you are working for someone else's project. So it could be their baby that they've spent years and years trying to get funded and you just rock up and, you know, you do have to carry out the work how they've planned it. You can have some input, but you don't have so much flexibility. Um, but yeah, I, I've had, you know, I was fortunate to have great relationships with all my supervisors, so I don't have any specific advice for what what to do if it goes wrong yeah likewise i've had such a positive experience that um i don't know if there's there's really much that i can add um i guess the thing is that because my pi is kind of remote um we do just kind of try to check in with each other occasionally um via email or via meetings on usually teams for better or worse um but yeah i think because my pi has just been so flexible about stuff i've you know had really good relationship with managing expectations and that kind of thing and i think they've been very sympathetic about the whole situation during the pandemic as well which has obviously impacted a lot of research um and a lot of mental health stuff as well so yeah i I've just had a really positive experience. So I think you still mentioned one thing in there that is quite useful, which is sort of managing expectations or communications. So you need know, to at least have that discussion so that everyone's clear you're not doing things behind someone's back and vice versa. Um, at least figure out what works, basically, I think. OK, good. Um, OK, let's So another question about um, doing I would like stop. to oh, go on, go chip on. in. Sorry. Yeah. So um, we've actually, with, with some other uh, researchers, we put a toolkit together that helps managers to support early career researchers. So I just put the link in for that, and there's some things that you can download in. But basically, it gives a whole list of things um, that managers can do, and and then also um, higher up faculties, right? Um, and the idea is um, that also early career researchers can have a look at this list and kind of see if there's things that they kind of want managers to do with them. So one thing to kind of manage your manager or something like that is to kind of have a look at these lists as well and kind of see like, is there these things that we can, you know, is there stuff that they can do? For example, things in there's like about, you know, making your, creating your own network, people that you kind of collaborate with and all these kind of things that you get a little bit of time for that. So. Um, it's worthwhile having a look at. Um, yeah, that's a good point. It might give you some useful ideas of things mm -hmm. you maybe hadn't even thought of as being relevant yeah. to your role or, or useful for your career. And then you can go, look, there's these suggestions on this website. Yeah. Can we, can we, yeah, we can thought. Yeah, including also like, you know, asking your manager to kind of open up their kind of network of people, you know, to introduce you to uh, other people and things like that. Or, send you to different institutes to kind of get some training and and, 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 and things like that. Yeah. Yes, I, I think it's important to be uh, as proactive uh, as possible because, uh, um, you know, the PIs may be running two or three other projects. They will have to deal with teaching and, and other admin stuff. So if you don't hear from them for a few weeks, it doesn't mean that uh, they're ignoring you or they don't care what you do, but, but rather, uh, they they simply have to to get on with some other aspects of of their uh, workload, but if you are proactive and remind them, uh, and you have a clear list of uh, things that you want to go through with them, um, then yeah, that that's a great way to structure uh, your interaction with the with with your mentor. Yeah, I guess it depends on what kind of um, management styles you get on best with. So sometimes it's useful 
to talk to other people, other, you know, PhD students or postdocs that the PI might have to kind of gauge what their kind of attitude is to people that they're working with. Um, because I, I quite like the fact that I won't hear from my PI for a couple of weeks and then suddenly we'll just have a big catch up. But other people feel, might feel like they need a bit more, um, more regular correspondence with their PI. So it also very much depends on what kind of style you work best with as well. Yeah, and, the, and as Alex has done, it, it's quite useful to try and meet the, the PI before you get start working with them and also speak with their past postdocs or PhD students and, and have a sense of how they interact with, with other people. And, and therefore, you know, you know exactly what to expect when, when you start working with them. Yeah, so, so a good way to manage them is to make a good decision in the first place to know something about them before you even start on the project and know that you get on or have similar interests and it sort of works well when you met with them and it wasn't too awkward, I guess. Um, yeah. Good. So I was going to jump back to one other question on about being a postdoc. So I know we've gone into some quite sort of complex things there. There was a slightly more general question. Basically, how is it different being a postdoc than being a PhD student? So if you're coming towards the end of a PhD and thinking about what you want to do, how is doing a postdoc uh, any different? Um, I guess it's just the, the more freedom to work on some of the projects and to, you know, have a bit of time set aside to work on um, kind of fellowship ideas that you would want to pursue, you know, your kind of your own research. Um, and that's, yeah, that's kind of the diff the major difference for me between a PhD and a postdoc is that sense of a bit more freedom as to what you're kind of studying, researching, what you want to research in the future. I had the complete different opposite experience. <laughs> When I when I did my because obviously the shift in field and a one year postdoc, I felt like I was doing another PhD. At the end of my PhD, I as I said, I wanted to have a break. Um, and yeah, that 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 did not happen. That was very stressful. I had to read up on uh, surface processes. I had to learn a new technique in the lab. Um, yeah, it it really honestly felt to me like I was doing another PhD, but in one year. Um, but I guess you get less surprises because, um, you know, you, you're just more comfortable evolving in, in academia um, once you've gone through your, P, your PhD. Um, yeah. I guess uh, as a postdoc, people have more confidence in in your research skill and in your maturity as a scientist that uh, you can crack on and and do the job that you that you need to do. Whereas with a PhD, sometimes, well, especially at the beginning, uh, you kind of need to feel your way around and and find your footing before you know exactly what what your research is about. So I think you. You have a much better idea how you, how your research fits into the bigger picture, into your research research group, and you also, as an individual, you have more confidence in in the skills that you have. Unless, unless again, like like Ellie, you you uh, start uh, something from scratch, which again it it's um, quite a different experience. But I, I guess now, Ellie, that you look back on it, it certainly was worth doing. Yeah, definitely. And like the community, the air surface process community has been so welcoming. And I and I can actually see myself, you know, fit in there and advance the scientific field uh, more than I did with paleo oceanography. Not to say that I don't want to go back to paleo oceanography, but it, it made me feel maybe a bit more comfortable in academia. Um, yeah, and, and I think that's something that maybe you get as a postdoc. Like your postdoc can be a completely different experience to what you did during your PhD. Um, you know, you, you might finish your PhD not knowing whether you want to stay in academia and, you know, doing a postdoc is a great way of making your mind up, not giving up straight away. Yeah, good point. Babette, did you want to? Yeah, so I also feel, I felt that means that, you know, a PhD is an individual project, right? This is you delivering on something and you get people kind of involved as co-authors and things like that that write papers with you, but it's mainly your work. 
was as a postdoc, not always, but in, with a lot of projects, you're kind of working with a bigger group as well sometimes, and you're collaborating and you kind of, you know, get drawing a much wider kind of area of different disciplines, which can be quite nice and, and rewarding. Um, yeah, helps you grow. <laughs> So one more specific thing on, because we should move on to thinking about sort of moving on in your career and things, but one more specific question from the chat. Um, what would be the point of view of a mentor, a mentor or PI if you had to take a break during the postdoc, for example, um, having children or, or health problems? Maybe about you, you can follow on with that. Um, I'm not sure what the question is. I mean... I guess, I guess they're saying... If, if, there, if there's something like this happens, yeah. um, then um, your mentor has to be supportive or your PI, right? No matter what. Um, it, it kind of depends on what kind of postdoc you have, what it's funded by. Um, for example, sometimes um, if you kind of have to take maternity leave or you have to take sick leave, uh, with some grants, you can ask for funding to kind of be added afterwards so that there can be extension to it. And sometimes it doesn't work and then the PI has to get someone else in to cover for the period that you're not there or something like that. Um, but, you know, they should always kind of uh, be positive and helpful in um, any way that they can, right? That's, uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Life, life, that there's life. <laughs> that's life yeah. and that's slightly more important than yeah. the fine details of, you know, six months on a postdoc contract yeah. or something. So, okay, fine. Let's, let's move on to... Um, some interesting questions about sort of developing beyond being a postdoc. Um, so one really well, really good question here says, um, how do you go about balancing all the opportunities that can arise during a postdoc, like teaching, uh, running workshops, um, student supervision uh, committees, which could obviously take time away from actually doing research uh, in the lab or you know, in, a, in, in, in a modeling sense? So how do you balance all those opportunities? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I guess it's just having a really good calendar on Outlook for me is just as soon as things come up, just try and put it in the calendar and also um, maybe put your kind of projects that you're working on into blocks as well so that you've got kind of time blocks for when you're working on your project for your PI, when you're working on past PhD stuff or, you know, future research. Um, and then obviously putting time in for seminars, for, um, you know, learning modules, that kind of thing. Um, is That's kind of the way that I try to keep myself a bit organized. Um, I guess it's also kind of trying to understand your limits. Um, so if you get kind of bombarded by people requesting peer reviews of articles, just being able to say, a polite no that you're really busy at the moment um because you will have times where you're incredibly busy for a couple of months and then times where you you're perhaps not so busy and then you can add in a few other bits of of work as well yeah i i honestly i am constantly struggling <laughs> with juggling all, all these things and i think that that's I mean, there are a few superheroes who managed to do it, but I think that most people, you know, you, you won't be alone if, if you're struggling um, to keep up, um, especially when contracts are so short. And you have to factor into that as well, like all the stress and logistics involved with relocating, especially if it's like one, two year postdocs or fellowships and, you know, just trying to ship all your stuff over and find accommodation and get into the system and get health insurance that can take like literally sometimes months um, before it's all settled so yeah don't expect to get much work done when you first start your postdoc like let yourself settle in um, yeah do either of uh, Vassil or um, the better have thoughts on this and there's a general question that came up as well which is basically what types of these sort of non-research activities do you do and sort of uh, how does it help you in your postdoc? So we'll wrap that in with the same question. Um, but how did the two of you find things? Well, uh, in a way, you if if you target an academic career, you will you will never have as much time to do research as you have during a postdoc. Um, at, at least not like 
complete blocks of time. Because then once you get into a permanent academic job, which involves teaching and admin, your time is so, so much more fragmented into smaller chunks that it's difficult to find the, the time and concentration to, to work on anything specific for a long time. Um, so maybe, yeah, a postdoc is, is a good trial, if you will, if an academic career is for you, if you can't manage it that, uh, as a postdoc with different commitments for reviewing and sitting on committees and all of the things that come with it, then, uh, then, then maybe, let's say, you should focus on research in, uh, in the industry um, or more uh, of a nine to five job that might be uh, more suitable for you. It's always it's always a struggle, I would say, no matter at what level you are, what stage, whether you're a postdoc or, or, or a permanent uh, academic somewhere. Um, and yeah, uh, different people work best in, in different ways. I don't know. I, I don't have a universal formula. I wish I had, uh, but I, I'm still looking for it myself. So if you guys have it, you let me know. <laughs> uh -huh. And just add, I think it's just the best thing is to try and balance it, right? And not to go overboard on one. So obviously one thing that's important is publications. Um, even though with narrative CVs, things are changing a little bit. I think, you know, it's still important to kind of show the output that you're creating and stuff like that. Um, and if you get invited to do 20 talks, um, you know, do all the same talk and you can do it online, maybe that's okay, but if you have to travel and you kind of spend months traveling just to do that, it might be all right to just uh, say to a couple like, no, I haven't got time basically. So as a postdoc, it's probably a good time also to learn how to say no <laughs> um, to certain things, so. Yeah. I, I think that that's really an, an important uh, point, Babette, because uh, yeah, you, uh, I found it at the beginning very difficult to, to say no, because people wanted to work with me on on some very exciting projects and and of course i i couldn't couldn't say no but you as i got older you quickly find out that uh, you know time is finite and you really can't do everything that you want um and you should choose something that you find specifically rewarding and that you find joy in working with and and don't neglect you know the, your leisure time as, as well and your you know, as a postdoc, your most important asset is your mind, right? So you, you need to be in the right mental space and uh, with the right attitudes to be able to take joy from, from what you do. So don't just focus on work and reviewing and teaching and, and do other things outside academia, which brings you joy. And when, when you get back to the task, then you are in a much better uh, mental space. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I would say make sure that you do have outside kind of interests and try and keep them up as much as possible, because if you just dedicate yourself to work, you'll burn out and then you'll be less productive as well. So it's it's having a balance between work and life as well. So another good question that we've had, and there's a couple of related questions that have been popping up in the chat relates to, and this also follows on from something Basile said, um, working in industry. Um, so for example, would it be um, advantageous to spend some time in roles in industry along the way of your kind of postdoc um, journey? And, and if so, what kind of experiences would be um, good? And similarly, there are questions um, saying, you know, is working experience relevant before taking on a postdoc position? Would PIs be um, uh, happy to accept someone who's been work in work? Or would they rather have people who are coming straight from uh, a PhD? So I guess those are two slightly uh, related questions, um, but who, who might like to have, have thoughts on uh, industry uh, and working outside of academia? I can't say that I have personal experience with that. There's not many postdocs wanted to work with Spilithems after coming uh, from an industry background. But I can't see why it would be any kind of disadvantage to come from a, a postdoc position, um, from an industry position, sorry. So I, I can't think of any downsides from my point of view. I don't know, maybe Babette has uh, different thoughts. I have no experience either, but I, I do know of examples where um, people have gone into industry, for example, to work with Thermal, 
and afterwards kind of applied for jobs and been offered postdocs, you know, long five-year postdocs. In the end, they didn't take it because they thought, you know, the pay for industry was a bit better. But yeah, there's, you know, there's all sorts of options. So. Yeah, well, sort of as an example, I, after I finished my undergrad, um, I went into the publishing industry and I was working in the publishing industry for about eight years before I then did a master's and then my PhD and then straight into a postdoc. So I have had kind of sort of industry experience prior to being back on the academic track. And I think that actually helped me to get onto a PhD position and probably then helped with the postdoc because I'd, you know, I'd gone away. I hadn't had, you know, this kind of pipeline from undergrads to masters to PhD to postdoc. I'd taken a bit of break and that kind of showed my enthusiasm for being back into science and wanting to do a PhD and then a postdoc. So I think it helps, certainly. Just one thing, there's certain funding and fellowships that it might be a disadvantage because if you, for example, do a PhD, then do industry and then want to do postdoc, um, some, some grant schemes start counting your time post PhD. So it doesn't matter whether you're in industry or in academia. And then it can be a disadvantage if you, because, you know, uh, if they also look at number of publications and things like that, then it could, you could be disadvantaged because you haven't been publishing for those number of years that you were um, outside of academia, basically. But that's not with all um, schemes. And there's a lot of them that actually do take it into account and some also see it as a good thing, so. I think we'll have, we've have we approached two o'clock, so we'll just have one final um, question. It's been, it's flown by, you've had such interesting things to say. Um, but we just finished with, um, and this sort of um, also links in with one of the questions uh, we've been asked in the Q&A as well. Basically for someone that's um, applying for a postdoc, or for that matter, someone who already is a postdoc, what would be your one um, sort of top tip that someone should, should take home from um, after this session to put into their uh, thinking about sort of post postdocing or into their current postdoc. Uh, it's a really good question. Um, just kind of do as much research as you can about um, what kind of positions are out there in terms of fellowships and jobs. Make sure that you kind of do a bit of research and yeah, when you're applying, make sure that you kind of highlight what you can bring to the project, all the key skills that you have gained over your PhD and your postdoc. Or, and yeah, just as Ellie said, apply for things, even if you don't meet all of the desirable criteria, because you never know what you might get. Uh, Ellie? Yeah. Um, yeah, just be open minded, honestly, and be bold as well. Like, You'd be surprised. I, I, I'm sure that Facil gets all the time like applications that are absolutely not relevant to the job advertisement. People do it. Um, so just, you know, I'm sure that you have some sort of uh, experience that's relevant to a job. If you're interested, just go for it and don't let a shift of field hold you down. Just, yeah, just go. Great. Uh, Basil? Um, build your network as wide as possible. Yeah, nice. And um, Babette? Yeah, tailor your CV and your cover letter to the, uh, what you're applying for. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So I think some, some of these are also good points for um, the end of a postdoc if you're looking to apply for um, academic positions and permanent positions and things as well. So some of these things are very much translatable to that very, very final step in being a postdoc, which is no longer being a postdoc. Um, so hopefully it'll be useful for that too. Um, so I'll just refer back to one other thing from that last question about industry. As you can see, as it happens, our current crowd are not particularly hot on having been in industry in terms of having that experience. But we have a our other panel series, the Out of Academia series, covers people who've interacted between industry and academia, moved into industry jobs from academia. So there are several of those videos on the YouTube site. Uh, and so those are probably really useful for giving ideas if you're 
um, field sort of bridges between the two, or you're not sure if you'd be interested in working in uh, academia or industry. So I'd encourage you to go and take a look at, uh, at, that, at those videos too. Um, so apart from that, thank you so much to the four of you for sharing your time uh, and your experiences. I hope that's um, helpful for the, uh, for the participants. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get to absolutely every question. If any of you have um, sort of questions that are burning on, on you still, and we've not managed to answer them, then feel free to email me and I can try and provide some uh, pointers to your specific questions uh, after this session. Um, and then finally, hopefully some of you, um, we'll look forward to perhaps seeing some of you in the Geochemistry Group uh, Research and Progress meeting in uh, Cambridge in uh, next month in uh, April. So thank you very much everyone and um, have a good afternoon.